Hi, everyone. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm Pastor Heidi Hester, and I welcome you to this time together as we have our prayer service and time of diving into God's scripture for this third Sunday in Lent. We continue in our Lenten journey of hope to be reminded that God is with us and in the midst of all that we are dealing with in our lives these days, God promises to be with us and reminds us of the great gift of grace and hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And so we pray that this time together will give you that sense of hope and encouragement for the week ahead. With that, we begin with um, a prayer of confession. We know that uh, there are so many things that pull us away from, from God's love in our lives, so many things that we stumble across or stumble upon or fall just flat on our faces, um, and that we, we're not worthy of the love that God gives us. But in Christ Jesus, we are given that hope that we have been given a grace far beyond our own measure, far beyond our own worth because of what Jesus did for us. So let us enter into a time of prayer and a time of remembrance and a time of gratitude. So let us pray. Merciful and gracious Savior, we have been a wayward people. We are dead in our sins, and yet you give us life. We have wandered away from you, become exiles, and yet you rescue us and carry us home. We have been sick and broken and needy, and yet you heal and restore us, bring us into your wholeness. Gracious God, we deserve none of this. We deserve the penalty that you bore on our behalf, yet your love is so deep. Your mercy is so wide. You, your embrace is so all-enfolding that you have done for us what we could never do for ourselves. You have made us your own. You have forgiven us, and you have loved us in Christ Jesus. And so we receive this gift with gratitude, with joy, and with awe. For the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. And my friends, Lent offers us this chance to begin again, to renew our faith and to know that God knows us through and through and loves us, calls us beloved. So know that in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. So our gospel story for this third week in Lent um, is from the Gospel of John, uh, the second chapter. And so we pick up uh, during the celebration of Passover. So the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at the tables. Now, making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out to the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And so the Jews then said to Jesus, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them and said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, But this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, grace to you and peace from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want to start off our time together today with a question. 
At any time during this past year, have you ever been so frustrated or angry that you just wanted to break something or throw something? Yeah, probably. I know we all have had those moments in our lives and, and it's a natural response for us humans to have that rush of adrenaline that occurs when that fight response comes into our adrenal system because of anger. And once that adrenaline is, is shooting through our bodies, there's got to be a way that we have to expend that energy uh, once it builds. And so our initial response is to break something or throw something, or it's just a way to expel that energy. And when you think about it, when we get invested emotionally or physically in something and then experience it not being used as we had intended, or being appropriated for something else, or not being understood, we naturally have this response to want to do something about it. We've seen that happen over and over and over again in this past year. Really, we, we see that as we look at the human experience. I've been thinking a lot about that this past week, probably also because it's this story uh, in the Gospel of John of Jesus overturning the money changers at the temple. It's such an important story in Jesus' ministry that all four Gospels have this story. Because I think it's one of those moments where Jesus' humanity is on full display. He confronts what the temple has become because it's not what it was supposed to have been. And I think it's one of those most human moments that we see that Jesus allows us to see and to be revealed to us. So as we get into this story, we have to know just a little bit of the background of the temple. Um, oftentimes we think of the temple as just another church, maybe a, a cathedral or something like that. But really, as we understand it, a church building is where God's people gather. But back then, the temple wasn't just a place in a building. It was actually the place where God dwelt on earth. It was the only place to worship God in Israel, unlike having a church on every other corner for us. It was God's house, literally and figuratively. It wasn't just one of the houses of God. So the temple was, was really important. In the heart of the temple complex, in the heart of the city which served as the spiritual and political heart of Israel, God dwelt among God's people. That was God's touching point on earth. And in that holiest of holies, in, in the back part of the temple, was the holiest of holies, where only a few priests could go, and actually only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies. That was where God dwelt. It's where uh, it was thought that the Ark of the Covenant was kept. At least that's what Indiana Jones tells us, right? But it is in that place where God dwells. It is the, that fluid point between heaven and earth. And in that holiest of holies is God, God's promise, God's throne, God's place. Only the priest could go in. But then outside of that temple was the, the area where all the sacrifices were made. It was that place where people could atone for their sins, atone for the ways they had not been able to uphold the commandments or the laws of God. And then outside of that realm was where people could come and, and, and be those who were not priests themselves, those who were faithful. And then outside of that was the area that those who were not Jewish could come and be a part of the life of the temple. Now, since most people would travel to Jerusalem to make their sacrifices, it was hard for them to bring those items needed to make the sacrifices. You couldn't bring a whole bunch of, of lambs or, or cattle or oxen or, or sheep with you or doves or grain things. It would just be too hard. And so the temple began to offer this service to those who came. They began to offer grain sacrifices and livestock for sacrifices. And because the temple had its own money that they could use without any graven images on it, 
people would come in with Roman coinage and they would have to exchange it for temple coinage so then they could go purchase their sacrificial livestock or grains or whatever they needed to do. See, the temple wasn't just God's dwelling place. It was a place for commerce. It was a place for haggling. It was a place for community. But in doing this, in trying to be helpful for the people of God, the temple's focus and prior priorities began to be, I don't know, diverted. It got muddy what the purpose was, and the temple was still the place where God dwelt, but outside the holiest of holies, well, it became a marketplace. So when Jesus comes in on this day in our story, the commerce of the temple is all up and going, right? But what Jesus was commenting on and what got it to him was that the temple was no longer what used to be important. It was really announcing the way that God's way of relating with us, with humanity, was about to change. Because the temple was no longer needed. Those sacrificial um, livestock and grains were no longer needed because Jesus himself would become the sacrificial lamb for us. Now, what's interesting is this, this story comes um, in the Gospel of John at the very beginning. It's not uh, toward the end right as he goes into Holy Week, but it's the beginning of his ministry because it is an important reminder that he knows that his purpose is to come and change the way God relates to us. And also, it was a way for Jesus to say, no longer is this the only place that God will dwell here on earth. Because Jesus is saying that he is now the place where the presence of God dwells. That's a huge thing to upset, not only the money changing tables, but their whole way of understanding how God works and how God's love and grace was given out to people. Jesus saw that people were so caught up in the process of trying to make things right in their relationship with God, they were unable to see God in their midst. They were distracted. And they were just going through the motions because they wanted to gain something from God as opposed to just receiving it. Jesus' outburst was just the beginning, at least in the Gospel of John, for God's gift and hope and grace to be revealed to the people of God. And it started at the temple, the very place where God resides. So our Lenten journey this year is focused on hope. Because I believe that hope is always at the core of who we are as Christians. And it's even more important to understand and be able to share that in our daily lives, especially this year. To have hope in Christ Jesus is to recognize that we no longer have to struggle day to day to gain God's acceptance or prove that we are worthy of God's love. Because if we're truthful, we know that we can never live up to that standard. Jesus knew that. Paul even knew that. Martin Luther knew that. Because the law of God convicts us daily. There is no way that we are worthy to receive God's love and hope and grace. But that's why this story is so important, especially during this Lenten journey, and especially at the beginning of John's Gospel. Because it is in this story that a new chapter for humanity and our relationship with God begins. Jesus knew that he would become the sacrificial scapegoat on our behalf and that it would change everything. Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says, the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's foolish because who would think that one man could offer this gift of hope and salvation to humanity age through age through age? It's foolishness because this gift means that we no longer have to live our lives hoping to earn our way into God's love and forgiveness. It's because it's a gift we don't have to make amends for the foolish ways we live our lives or treat other people or ignore God's call to this abundant life in Christ Jesus. But this gift of hope and grace that is given to us in Christ Jesus 
comes through his ultimate death and resurrection. And this is a gift given to the world. No strings attached. Because you see, my friends, God meets us where we are. Because the atonement, the, the right reckoning of our sins has already been done for us in Jesus on that cross. God meets us where we are in bread and wine, in community, whether it's virtual or in person. God meets us as we remember our baptismal promises of being beloved children of God. God meets us when we take time to pray and to, to dive into scripture, to be reminded that the noise and chaos of this world has nothing to us, that we are called to dive into God's hope and mercy and grace and pray for a few minutes a day, read scripture a few minutes a day so that we may ponder the gift that God has given us, a gift that makes your heart sing. The gifts that continue to help you wake up in the morning and give you purpose and meaning as we respond to this gift that we have been given. Because you see, friends, our call is to go out and share that gift, to be God's hands and feet and do God's work in his place at this time. We're all interconnected, and when we do that, when we take time to be in God's hope, in God's light, and we share that, it then sort of just expands from us. And the world is changed, transformed. Frederick Buechner in his book, uh, The Hungering Dark, compares humanity to a gigantic spider web. And he writes this, he says, if you touch it anywhere, you set the whole thing trembling. Now, as we move around this world and as we act with kindness, perhaps, or with indifference or even with hostility toward the people that we meet, we too are setting the great spider web a tremble. The life that I touch for good or ill will touch another life and then in turn another and then another until who knows where the trembling stops or in what far place and time my touch will be felt. Our lives are linked. Did you feel the tremble of Jesus overturning the tables? Because those overturned money tables, those skittering doves and goats and sheep and, and all sorts of things that day was a reminder that we are linked to the one who is making all things new who promises that our sins will not keep us away from God, that we don't have to earn anything, but that through him, we are saved. So let us keep extending that tremble from us and to those around us. May God use our heads, our hands, and our hearts this week to remind the world of God's hope that is here and now in Christ Jesus through us. May we be such a blessing. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as we ponder how God is calling us to use us in this life, how God is calling us to proclaim that hope and grace, part of what we do is we come together in prayer to be reminded that God hears our prayers, those calls that are so deep within us that sometimes even words don't make it out. But God hears us. God knows our deepest wants and needs and desires, wants to hear our thanksgivings and praise. So we now come together to spend a few minutes in prayer. So relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all those in need. God, there is no God before you. We pray that you would purify the faith of your church that your people place their trust in nothing but you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation, your people's words and actions honor your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, the heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. 
Give all people the willingness to live and work toward an abundant and healthy life in and with your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy throughout the world. God, your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislatures, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering, especially those whom we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you call us to proclaim Christ crucified. So give clarity to this congregation so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves only our own interests. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, the cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for all the martyrs whose witnesses reveal the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, make us bold to call you our Father as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may God bless you, that you might be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Now go in peace and share the good news of Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>